Welcome to the History of the Papacy podcast, a podcast about the history of the popes of Rome and Christian Church. Prepare yourself to step behind the ropes and leave the official tour of the story of the popes and Christianity. I am your host, Steve Guerra, and I thank you for joining me on this journey. You can find show notes, how to contact me, sign up for our mailing list, and how to support the history of the papacy by going to our website, a2zhistorypage.com. Two great ways to support the history of the papacy are leaving your ratings and reviews on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. And another really great way to support the history of the papacy is by going and joining us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash history of the papacy. Your support on Patreon goes a long, long way to help keep the history of the papacy sustainable for a long time in the future. There are four tiers of support on Patreon. Antioch, Alexandria, Constantinople, and Rome. Each of these tiers represents one of the traditional patriarchates of early Christianity. There are many great benefits to you for supporting the show on Patreon. You will receive early and advertisement-free content, bonus episodes, monthly book drawings, and most importantly, you will be included on the history of the papacy diptychs. In traditional Christianity, the diptychs are the lists of bishops commemorated in order of their precedence. The sooner you sign up on Patreon, the higher you'll be on the lists of the history of the papacy patrons. Now let us commemorate the Patreon patrons on the History of the Papacy Diptychs. We have Roberto, Joran, William B., Brian, Christina, Sarah, William H., Augustus, Keanu, and Judy at the Alexandria level. We have Doppel, Paul, Justin, Lana, John, Steve, and Sean, all of whom are magnificent at the Constantinople level and reaching that ultimate power and prestige, that of the Sea of Rome. We have Peter the Great, Alex the Great, Amma the Great, Frederick the Great, and Jeffrey the Great. I want to send a special shout out today to a friend of the show and listener Sherry, who is now doing transcriptions of episodes. So she's taking the machine transcriptions that I have been putting to episodes and she's cleaning them up and making them a lot more accurate. So if there's something that you want to go back and read or you're using this for some purpose and you want to be able to read the transcript or even go back and search up something that we talked about in an episode, those transcripts will be available to you. So I want to thank Sherry very much for taking on this monumental project. It's very much appreciated. Before we get started today, I have another quick thing to mention. I'm excited to share that we now have a new show on the Parthenon Podcast Network, History of North America, hosted by Mark Vinette. In this podcast, he explores interesting, compelling, wonderful, and but sometimes tragic stories of the North American continent, its inhabitants, heroes, villains, leaders, environment, and geography. Mark releases new episodes every week and has more than 100 episodes that are about 15 minutes or less, all about U.S., Canada, and Mexico, and they're all available to stream right now. Just search for History of North America on your favorite podcast app to start listening. You can go listen to a couple of collaborations that I've done with Mark already on the Treaty of Tordesillas and the great film and book Black Robe. So look for more collaborations from Mark and I in the future. And with that, here is the next piece of the mosaic of the history of the Popes of Rome and Christian Church. Today we have a little bit of an addendum before the actual end of the series, on Pius IX in the U.S. Civil War. I'm putting the finishing touches on the series about Pius IX and the papacy of the 19th century. Like I said, this is a addendum, but we're not officially ended, 
done with the series yet. So it's maybe a little bit of a sidetrack, you might even say. But it, I think it's a really important topic, especially for you American history fanatics out there, uh, American history slash history of the papacy. It's interestingly enough, a little background, if you <laughs> if you care about such things, is that I've been working on this episode on or off since before COVID started and really before this even series. I was even a kernel of an idea in uh, the back of my mind was to talk about the papacy and the U.S. Civil War. I just stumbled upon a couple of sources and a couple just brief mentions while I was researching something else, like it's probably four or five years ago, and it just fast and fascinated me, and I just kept uh, chipping away at it a little at a time and not really knowing when to place it into uh, any other series or any other episode. So I figured let's just go with it now because it really does fit perfectly with this whole series on Pius the Ninth because it is about what Pius the Ninth thought about the U.S. Civil War. For our non-U.S. listeners, I thought I'd just give a little bit of background on the U.S. Civil War, especially because the background and the buildup to it has a lot of parallels between the rise and the fall and the rise again of the papacy during the 19th century. And the timeline really matches up very closely because the history, the things that led up to, the events that led up to the U.S. Civil War started at about the French Revolution and the Age of Enlightenment and ended in really, you could say, in the 1860s, but more probably more formally in the 1870s, which we'll get to. I might give a shout out here to our old friend, Professor James Early, who hosts a podcast called the Key Battles of American History podcast. He did an entire series on the battles of the U.S. Civil War. So if you're into battles and guns and all that stuff, that's a good place to look. But also he does a really good job of going into the background of the war as well. So if you want more details, that's a good place for you. So we go all the way back to the Age of Enlightenment and the American Revolution. It's an enlightened revolution in a lot of ways, but it's also a reactionary revolution. And there's a, another shout out if you want to learn more is Mike Duncan's treatment of the American Revolution. I'm not a huge fan of where the direction he went in the later Epi uh, series on his Revolutions podcast, but I would have to say his treatment of the American Revolution is one of the best things I've ever heard or read or anything on the whole topic of the American Revolution. And that's saying a lot because I think most history nerds have read a lot on it. And I would say that that is the top one or two treat best treatments, in my humble opinion, on the topic. Slavery was a huge, huge, huge issue in the formation of the United States, along with this idea of decentralization and centralization. The problems of slavery and then centralization of this new American project and decentralization of power are really the, the key issues of the whole thing. In the very foundation of the United States and the, and then the little bit later foundation of the Constitution, essentially slavery is an issue that just gets kicked down the road. It's a can that just got kicked and kicked and kicked. If we look in the 50-ish, a little over 50 years, almost 50 to 75 years between the foundation of the United States to the revolutions of 1848, the United States is growing and growing and growing. And it can essentially, it can afford to kick the issue of slavery and the issue of centralized power versus decentralized power within the states down the road. There's various compromises, the Missouri Compromise and the Compromise of 1830 and all these different things to basically make peace between the various factions, the pro-slavery and the anti-slavery, the centralizing tendency that was going on, and then the decentralized push as well. The U.S. 
survived the revolutions of 1848 basically because there was no revolution of 1848. The United States had essentially dealt with those issues and was dealing with those issues throughout the entire first half of the 19th century. So it just didn't need to deal with them. They weren't issues here as I mean, even if you look in 1848, there's the Mexican-American War that the U.S. wins big. It's honestly the last time of good feelings for a long time in the U.S. because the U.S. got to really drop the hammer on a power that was perceived to be strong, which was actually fairly weak. But the U.S. gets to beat up on another guy, another country, get a lot of territory. It's the fruition of Manifest Destiny in a lot of ways. Steve here again. We are a member of the Parthenon Podcast Network, featuring great shows like Josh Cohen's Eyewitness History and many other great shows. Go to Parthenon Podcast to learn more. And now, here is a quick word from our sponsors. The U.S. thrived in the 1840s. 50s in a lot of ways, but really it also started to collapse in a lot of ways as well with slaveries coming to a head. The issues of where power is going to be held, will it be held in the federal government in Washington or is each state going to remain basically a state in that full sense of the word? We have the Civil War, which goes from 1861 to 1865. Obviously, if you know the United States, the United States, as in the Union, wins the war, the North and not the Southern Confederate States. And really the whole, the old bottom line of the U.S. all falls out at that point. The the whole idea that the U.S. isn't going to really be an imperial power is all gone. Then the whole notion of that is gone. The United States is an inland empire that has its eyes to become an overseas empire. Manifest destiny and the crushing of the Native Americans, that's all going to start happening. Yes, slavery is formally abolished, but there's going to be a lot of problems with with the aftermath of slavery, with uh, Jim Crow, you name it, is all going to come out of there. The Reconstruction period is all in there, a ton of problems, and that's all really lining up very closely with the rise, the fall, and the rise again of the ultramontane papacy. Go back and listen to our episodes with Marco, with Joe Pescone, and you're going to see a lot of the ups and downs of the papacy and then the Risorgimento Italian state goes up and down at the same time, but for different reasons in different ways. Let's talk about Catholics in the United States. Catholicism in the United States and what what's more properly to say colonial america and then the the american colonies goes back really to day 1 with spanish colonization one of the reasons christopher columbus went on his journey of exploration and the other explorers was to convert people to the roman catholic faith in the in the colonial america and then going into United, the United States, Catholics were always second-class citizens, and in some cases got really terrible treatment. That goes in. That goes back to the old British days. Something very similar was going on in Britain at the same time. This uh, British Protestant Anglican mentality of being anti-Papist, anti-Catholic Church. Then we get the explosion of Irish Catholic and German Catholic immigration that starts happening in the early part of the 19th century. And then it'll eventually spill over into Southern European, particularly the Southern and Eastern European with the Italians and then other Slavic uh, Catholic immigration when these Catholics come, they're all, they're brand new immigrants for the most part. And so what do Catholics do in a war that really isn't their own war? There's a really ugly history of immigration 
and immigrants being forced to fight when they really don't want to fight. They're drafted. Draft, the, we have the whole draft riots that uh, most famously in the gangs of New York are portrayed that it's a war. It's a civil war inside of a civil war inside uh, in New York City that's very excellently portrayed uh, dramatically in the movie, but in the book as well, that it's the immigrants just don't care about the war, but they're being forced to fight and die when under Abraham Lincoln's own rules, the rich people can get out of the war because all they have to do is pay to get out of the war. The immigrants can't get out of the war. They can't uh, pay their way out, so they have to fight. There's some scenes from the the movie Gangs of New York that are a bit anachronistic, but they, uh, because it's really making, I feel more of a Vietnam War comparison, but you can, they show the picture of Irish getting off of these off of the boats from Ireland, they're getting immediately drafted in, and then they cut over to another boat in the port of where coffins are coming off of the boats, where I think in most cases, a lot of the people were actually buried in the battlefield, but that's a different story. But a visually stunning and visually shows a whole different aspect to the war. We have Catholics in the North and then Catholics in the South. We have mostly Irish and then a lot of German Catholic immigrants. And then in the South, a lot of old line Catholics who had been and wealthier Catholics who had been living there since colonial times, many of whom were slaveholders. So we get two very different flavors of Catholicism in this war. Let's... uh, Move over to Pius IX for just a second. He's buried in his own troubles, but still involved in U.S. affairs, which I find interesting. Old Pius took a very complicated position, as you might expect, is what Pius does. The U.S. Civil War involved many issues, Catholics, and particularly somebody like Pius IX would have been very interested in. Pius was dealing with at least from his own perspective, of a Europe that was highly divided politically and a Italy that was highly divide, divided politically along religious, political lines, cultural lines, lines that were very starkly drawn as well. There was not a lot of room for gray area. That's something that's very similar to going on in the United States. Catholics in many respects, and particularly the papacy and the ancien regimes, were very reactionary. And in a way that we're trying to find some parallels, but there's also some parallels that just don't line up. Back then, as well as today, the political environment of the United States just doesn't line up very well with European politics, right versus left, and state versus liberty. They just don't really compare. And I think that that's where some of the confusion and the controversy comes in with somebody like Pius IX. Let's take a quick look at the North versus the South in the United States, and that might exemplify what was go- what I'm talking about. Before the mid-1880s, Catholics mostly lived in Maryland and Point South. They owned slaves, even the Jesuit, the Jesuits who started Georgetown owned slaves. This was not particularly popular amongst Catholics in the hierarchy, especially in Rome and in in Europe, and it wasn't popular with the Jesuits around the world as well. And remember, the Jesuits got into a whole pile of trouble in the early 1800s and the late 1700s for helping indigenous people and just stopping stopping them from being used as slave, essentially slave labor or uh, forced cuvee labor. Pope Gregory spoke out strongly against slavery. And other popes, generally, the whole the vibe of the papacy was to be vehemently anti-slavery. Yet, if we think back to the syllabus of errors, the papacy and the church in general was very pro-support stability in government. Sure, they didn't love a lot of the liberty, civil liberty and enlightened governments that were going around, but they would generally 
say that a person should follow the legitimate civil authorities. The famous Cardinal Antonelli thought that Catholics would fight as citizens for whatever government they were, legitimate government they were uh, under, and that they wouldn't fight as Catholics as this would be some sort of holy war type situation. Steve here again with a quick word from our sponsors. We're going to talk a little bit about um, one of the main articles that I used, used actual sources from La Civalta newspaper and then the Observer newspaper. The article that I used was called Views on American Civil War by Lolly and O'Connor the, from the Catholic Historical Review. La Civelta was the unofficial news outlet of the Holy See. It was set up by Jesuits in the 1850s and by the later time period in Pius IX's papacy, it became sort of the apologetic voice of the papacy and it was, um, it leaned anti-union, pro-Confederacy. Another source that the article uh, the views on the American Civil War really leaned on was called La Assouverture, which was another Italian newspaper that was also anti-union and pro-Confederacy in their outlook. Their takes are really interesting because it really falls outside of the dichotomy we see as Americans, speaking as an American, that we normally view the Civil War. It's basically what the, they're not looking at it as, oh, the North good, South bad, South good, North bad. They're looking at it from a really totally different perspective. It's really an outsider's perspective that we're generally anti-industrialist anti-progressive movement, you might call it, anti-enlightenment. They were against really the things that they were against in Europe, anti-modernism. They really were supporting a the, the more agriculturalist society in the South and the more uh, aristocracy-based society, you might call it. They saw North the northern states and Lincoln is hypocritical, and they viewed the north as instigating a, the war, which you can kind of see from their perspective again in their own country. They, the Italians and the popes and the papal states see the Italians as instigating and propagating a war, and the papal states as being essentially held together and held in place by one of the ancien regimes, France, and to a lesser extent, some of the other regimes, the old line regimes that are helping support, keep the papal state going. The papacy also saw the North as not searching for a peaceful resolution, and the generally the papacy tried to broker some sort of peace, which was out completely out and out rejected. These papers and the, the papacy viewed Lincoln as a weak political schemer, and they even called him long-winded. They also saw it in a way that the North especially had a really, really deep strain of anti-Catholicism, which was shown to the Irish Catholic immigrants the many of the abolitionists were very, very, very religious, but Protestant, and they had very, very bad things to say about the papacy. Uh, and they were very anti-papal, anti-Catholic church. Like I've said in other episodes, a lot of the institutions set up in the North were actually to, if not stamp out Catholicism, basically to inculcate and uh, steep Catholic children and Catholics into Protestant culture. And so the, the, the papacy seeing this because they're getting reports from Catholic bishops and the Catholics in the United States, and they're getting this for everything that the South uh, with slavery and everything 
the South was much more open religiously, even though they had a strain of anti-papalism and anti-Catholicism. That was more in the amongst the people and amongst firebrand preachers. As far as the uh, high level goes, Jews were very accommodated in the South. A lot of the richest Jewish culture going on was in places like Savannah and in Charleston in South Carolina. Jefferson Davis's right-hand man was a Jewish person named Judah Benjamin. Judah Benjamin came from a long line of or a, a Jewish family that had deep, deep ties to the South. The Catholics of Maryland, which was still in the north, but uh, there was a Catholic culture throughout the south. It was tied in more to the aristocracy. Generally, you could say at the high level, the South was more religiously tolerant than the North was, especially the high level of the governments. The Northern government was definitely a lot more anti-Catholic than the Southern government was. Also, the, the newspapers and the papacy, they saw the Emancipation Proclamation as a cheap political ploy. That was a very common view in Europe. They uh, saw the what Lincoln was doing is he freed the slaves in the southern parts that he didn't even control, yet kept slavery legal in the border states and in the places that it was already legal that were under his control. They, the Europeans and the papacy said that that was a complete political, hypocritical ploy. Again, the Europeans saw the war, the Civil War, very similarly to the revisionist way that many people see the war. Or the, I wouldn't say many people, that some people are see, starting to see the war today. These are the things that um, the reactionaries of today would scream, you're a lost causer. Lincoln is not the sainted figure in many ways that he's portrayed in the 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 textbooks and the textbook version of Lincoln. He was a political animal. He used politics constantly to get his aims and to see him as this sainted martyr of the Republic, I think, obscures who he really was. And I think maybe uh, the more realistic way of viewing Lincoln to me is more interesting, but I'm sure I'll get to, we'll stir up a discussion with that. On the other hand, though, because there's everything when you have the the papacy, there's always an other hand. Cardinal Antonelli, who was Pius the Ninth's right hand man, he thought that the Confederates should work through the established systems. He didn't think that they should go to war, and in a lot of ways, that's how Pius the Ninth viewed it. The the papacy and then expressed through this La Civilta newspaper didn't necessarily take sides on who should win. They really wanted the war to end. And I think that in a lot of ways, just to wrap this section up, that Pius IX really associated the U.S. Union, the North, with the forces of Italian unification that were arrayed against him. And I think that that's even though he really would have supported them on many, many other issues, especially being that they were that the North was anti-slavery, he would have supported that. He would have supported that the U.S., the the North, the Union was the legitimate political regime of the United States. So really, the Confederacy didn't have a right to rebel against them. I think that he would have also saw the South as being put upon like he was in the Papal State, and that they were in a way fighting for a some aspect of legitimacy. Again, it's a very, very complicated uh, situation, and you have to try and look at it in a full 360 to see how Pius IX and the uh, the church would have looked at this war. I think that Pius would have also thought that Italy could learn a lesson from this devastating war in the United States and keep away from devastating wars. Also, Pius IX, back to religion, he saw that maybe the U.S. was collapsing because of no unifying religion, particularly the Catholic religion. 
Pius IX wouldn't have supported any of the Protestant movements. And I think he would have thought that, hey, if the United States had was a Catholic nation, it wouldn't be going through these problems. To continue the wrap up, Pius IX would have saw that this is just one of the many problems that a country, a liberal enlightenment country like the United States would have had. These liberal ideas were a problem. The Civil War was ultimately a failure of the freedom of religion. It was a failure of rejecting Catholicism, which had rejected slavery for a long time. And really, even when you get into the some of the things that, oh, the papacy had supported slavery through this bull and through that bull, generally speaking, the Catholic Church was against slavery. They oftentimes didn't have a lot of tools or power to push against slavery, but they were definitely more often than not anti-slavery than they were pro-slavery, especially as the church which spoke through the papacy. They also thought it was really interesting, the the church and the papacy, that a liberalizing empire would really literally kill for liberty. I find it really fascinating that the the papacy and uh, Italian newspapers would write so much about the Civil War, and they really did. There was Civil War all the time in the newspapers until Lincoln was assassinated. And then that's pretty much the last word. One of the newspapers, La Asafature, or the uh, La Civilta, essentially has one line. President Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. That was all they said about it. It's very, very interesting to me as well to as we're in this wrap-up. I think it's so interesting too, and I just have to point it out. As much as Pius IX would have probably supported the North over the South on the on the bullet points. He really didn't seem to like Abraham Lincoln very much, but he really liked President Jefferson Davis of the Confederate States a lot. They even shared a couple of letters to each other, really flowing diplomatic letters, but that showed some legitimate mutual respect. And so I, there is a couple of the letters still exist. So I thought I would quote this letter, the, the entire letter. It's short. Uh, so it's the letter of Jefferson Davis by Pope Pius the Ninth. It was given at Rome on Saint, at Saint Peter's Basilica on the third day of November of 1863. And it reads, Illustrious and honorable president, we have just received with all suitable welcome the person sent by you to place in our hands your letter dated the 23rd of September last. Not slight was the pleasure we experienced when we learned from these persons and the letter with what feelings of joy and gratitude you were animated, illustrations and honorable president. I believe it's supposed to say illustrious. As soon as you were informed of our letter to our venerable brother, John, Archbishop of New York, and John, Archbishop of New Orleans, dated the 18th of October of last year, and in which we have, with all of our strength, excited and exhorted those venerable brothers that in their Episcopal piety and solitude they should endeavor with the most ardent zeal and in our name to bring about the end of that fatal war which has broken out in those countries in order that the American people may obtain peace and concord and dwell charitably together. It is particularly agreeable to us to see that you, illustrious and honorable president, and your people are animated with the same desires of peace and tranquility which we have in your letters inculcated upon our venerable brothers. May it please God at the same time to make the others, people of America and their rulers, reflecting seriously how terrible is civil war and what calamities it endangers. Listen to the inspirations of a calmer spirit and adopt resolutely the part of peace. As for us, we shall not cease to offer up the fervent prayers of God Almighty that he may pour out upon all the peoples of North America the spirit of peace and charity and that he will 
stop the great evils which afflict them. We, at the same time, beseech the God of mercy and pity to shed abroad upon you the light of his grace and attach you to us by perfect friendship. So some interesting points in this in this letter Pius the Ninth is saying that he thinks that this that war is evil and that the fatalities is evil, which I mean you can't argue war is violence and from a church point of view it's definitely evil. Pius mentions John of New York and then John of New Orleans. Archbishop John of New York was an Irish-born prelate named John Hughes. He led the the Archdiocese of New York through a massive growth, and then you and his, uh, then you have John of New Orleans, who was a French-born person, Jean Odin, who was the Archbishop of Galveston, and then was translated to be the Archbishop of New Orleans. He did a he was he did a lot of work with. Uh, caring for Catholics into deep, deep parts of Texas and really building the Episcopal order in Texas and then building the Episcopal order really throughout the entire South. I also get the the sense in the letter that really Pius just wants the war to end and Pius wants to start building the soft power of the papacy, which is something that we'll see that hard power of the papacy and the papacy as a civil secular leader's crashing and burning. It's going to be gone in just a few short years after this letter. The religious power of the papacy will be an absolute pinnacle of ascendancy in just a few short years. The next phase of the papacy after Pius IX exits the stage is going to be this building of soft power that we really see. I think one could argue that it's ab- maybe its absolute peak is under Pope John Paul II through the Cold War, but we're also seeing parts of it really through Pope Francis, the, the soft power of the papacy that's being built just a little bit, just a little bit here with Pope Pius IX. Did maybe Pope P- uh, Pius the Ninth see the Confederates as the underdog, as him, as he saw himself fighting against Italian unification and the the North as this other North American version of the Risorgimento of trying to stamp down all the local flair? I don't. I don't know. I can. I can personally read that into the story. Uh, did he see this industrial power, this industrial might of the North, the embodiment of everything of modernism, really trying to stamp out a traditional culture of the South? Obviously, with everything, there's always the issue of slavery hanging over it, and it's it's hard to stamp say that the what the South had going for it because they were enslaving massive amounts of people. I think that that's how Pius really saw this as an issue of modernity versus traditionalism. And I think that that's why, despite all the factors uh, and reasons why he would be against the Confederates in the South, I think that that's why he was maybe more inclined to see things more, or at least see the South in a more positive light than he would have saw the North. But as another last word on the issue, I think that that, that's why he wanted to see this war over, is that it was killing a lot of Catholics, it was killing a lot of people. And generally he was, and the papacy is against war. Now, I just really scratched the surface, and I've had some uh, listeners, such as Alex Calabrese, write in that about other aspects of the Catholicism in North America and in the um, in the United States. And these are all issues that I personally find fascinating as well. Maybe I'm seeing it from too much of an uh, American or U.S. perspective. But I would like to investigate them more. So I'm very much thinking of doing a series, an entire series on American history, but particularly Catholicism 
in American history. I think it's a very unique situation compared to a lot of uh, Catholicism as it was in a lot of other nations and areas around the world. So if this is something that you would like to hear sooner rather than later, definitely reach out and let me know, especially as we start to get to uh, the end of this series on the papacy of the 19th century. The last little bits of the pie are getting put into place, and you'll get to hear those soon. So I uh, very much thank you for joining me today, and I look forward to talking to you more in the future and talking more about the 19th century and Pius IX.